Hey, it's Dean here, and I'm with Sergio Weingarten of Low Cost Glasses. He's the CEO, and we're going to be talking about business. We're going to be talking about post-COVID recovery and how we got into the world of glasses. Sergio, welcome. Thank nice you. to meet. Although we think we've met before somewhere, yep. we're here to talk about uh, low cost glasses. Just before we kind of get into the whole post COVID and stuff, how did you get into this? Okay, so my background is actually not in optics. Um, I was actually a corporate financier. Um, I was working in the city um, and uh, I worked every hour that God sent. Um, and I was making lots of money for other people. And I thought, actually, I've always been um, quite commercial and always thought, you know, actually, my ultimate aim is not to go down the normal partnership route in a law firm and actually go into business. So about 10 years ago, I joined the business, um, which was uh, supporting Tesco, um, Tesco opticians. And I was in charge of their, um, their global operations. So we ended up opening in 10 countries um, all around Eastern Europe and then in Asia. Um, Malaysia, Thailand, and China, um, and so that's what my first real introduction to optics. Um, and I've basically spent the last ten years running optician shops globally, um, and I've understood the pressures of it. I've understood the challenges, and about just over a year ago, actually, we're now a year old. The company we launched an online uh, business, and I think my the main driver for that was that. Um, I've got so many friends who are directors and CEOs and all this, and they always, you know, they always come to me with their new glasses, and they're so smug, and they're like, "Do you like my new glasses?" And I'm like, "I bet you paid 500 quid for them. I bet you paid 300 quid for them." And actually, knowing the true cost was one of the big drivers because there's this mystery in the industry about how you have to get special coatings on your lenses. All these frames are specially manufactured. And I know actually, because I've been to the factories, I've been to the lens manufacturers, that actually it's all coming off the same conveyor belt. And a pair of frames, a good quality pair of frames, shouldn't cost you more than maybe a hundred pounds. And that the markup that these independent opticians and the multiples are making is, is insane. And so that was where we felt we were actually, it was one of our USPs that we could um, ensure we never compromised on quality, but actually offer people a pair of glasses that are of extremely high quality and, and the, tr the, the proof in the pudding actually which has been fantastic is that we've got over 25 percent customer return rate because there i think you know when you've got usp which is which we have of five pounds for prescription glasses um people expect five, five pounds five pounds yeah yeah five pounds um, people expect that what they're going to receive to be flimsy and rubbish and actually, when they get it, they're like, wow, that's incredible. Well, for, if, I'm, if I've spent five pounds, then I'm probably, because lots of people, um, there's two types of people that wear glasses. There's people that have 10 pairs because they're forever losing them. They have a pair in the car, they have a pair in the office, they have a pair next to the TV. And, ha you know, I've always um, either compromised on their glasses by getting ready readers or they've spent fortunes on, on, on their prescription glasses. But actually, we were able to do five pound prescription glasses what we're seeing is people are coming in and placing orders for 10 pairs of glasses at one time, which is fantastic. Um, and so we're building up uh, this loyalty and we're changing the customer um, buying habits of actually buying glasses more than once every year or once every two years. I obviously wear glasses, you can see. But my biggest thing is you, the eye test. You'd still do the eye test locally. Would you get the prescription? Uh, absolutely. And that's one of the things... That I remember being a frustration when I was running shops was that customers you have to physically and by law go into an opticians and get your eyes tested but then what you'd find is actually that people would be standing and looking at the, the frames taking photos of the frames um, googling the price of the frame whilst they're standing in your shop and I think the whole world is uh, the analogy I think about is banking 10 years ago you would never ever have believed that actually the vast majority of people do their banking online and it's like that with so much, and COVID has played into this um, massively as well, is that everything is online, and there's such great technology and tools on the low-cost glasses website um, and the information that, you know, we've got something called a virtual try-on, which is really augmented reality. So you can put the frame on your face with, on a live video, 
and it's got additional features like what the lenses would look like if you added a tint or a mirror and it's so easy and so unpressurized and you don't have any pushy sales assistants who are commission driven in 99% of the cases you know that you can actually sit in your own couch taking your time and go through the entire range if you want and if you don't want to buy anything that's cool as well so you are the amazon to waterstones in the glasses world not quite but that's what <laughs> We are trying to make things affordable and, um, you know, the fact that the glasses get de delivered direct to your house, you know, through your post box is, um, is a big plus, certainly mm -hmm. been in the last three months. Well, I, I'm going to ask you about that. So obviously COVID kicked in, um, everything shuts down. Now, if you lose your glasses, you're onto a winner there because you can Keep oper have you kept operating during COVID? I'd be lying if I said it was easy. It really did present uh, a number of different challenges. Um, personnel, you know, there was people that were um, not willing to come into work. There was um, people that weren't well. Thankfully, everyone has actually maintained good health. But right at the outset, we had um, half a dozen people that said that they were next to somebody that wasn't well. And there was a lot of self-isolation going on, which provided challenges. But probably the biggest challenge for us was that um, all, all our frames that we sell, we hold in stock. Um, so that so frame supply was never an issue for us, but it was actually the lenses. Because of six million permutations of lenses, lenses tend to get made to order. Mm -hmm. um, and two of our major suppliers uh, closed with a 24 hours notice. Um, and that caused chaos because um, with uh, lenses, there's different lead times depending on the type of lens. So if you're a simple single vision, distance user, those glasses within certain parameters, uh, those lenses are pretty much readily available. If you're like a very focal wearer or you have a very high index, like a thinner lens, um, they can take two to three weeks. And all of a sudden we found that actually there was tons of um, c customer orders caught up in this um, world where they just stopped. So all of a sudden we're having to backtrack and go, okay, well, which customers are impacted by this? And it wasn't like there was any communications with them or, you know, these are this is a list of what you've got. So we're all of a sudden, we're having to go back three weeks um, into, you know, what our ordering books. And it was it was chaotic. Um, we were actually, it was, it was a bit chaotic um, because we didn't have enough people on the team at the time. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, these lens suppliers closed and there was no, some of them are still not fully reopened. I guess everybody's, you know, to varying degrees, everybody's been in that kind of same boat of figuring out, you know, how long does this last for? How, how is there a second spike? How, how does this play out? And whilst your business is online, the supply chain is, is real with people. One of the things I did, which was, I think, probably more lucky than anything, and I think there's a, in, in all businesses, a lot of luck was actually right at the outset of this, um, on the, I think it was a Wednesday, and it was just starting to heat up this whole um, COVID-19 thing. We'd, I decided with my senior team that we'd actually test what remote working from home was for the entire office staff. So mm -hmm. uh, 30 people went home um, with printers and monitors and desktops and everything, and uh, we, we tested it on a Thursday and Friday. And actually, that was, that was really good luck um, because on the Monday, it was like everyone needs to stay at home. And actually, you know, with, we had a few teething problems, but actually on the whole, it's worked very well. And I would say it's adapted my mentality because I was very old school in the sense of I like people to sit in the office. I was never a work from home advocate. And, you know, having three children myself, I now have the utmost respect for, for from working from home. Um, I've got flexible working in the truest sense. I've got one of my, my head of marketeering. Uh, my head marketeer is, um, she's got a young daughter. And she comes online 6.30 to 9.30, then plays with her daughter for a few hours while her husband does her, his job, and then she comes back online. And I'm much more relaxed about that than I ever thought probably possible because I was very corporate in, the, in, in my early uh, career in industry. I was you know, a bit too corporate. I'd only ever worked in law firms and you just work all day and all night, and that's what you do. And you're working from home is seen as a holiday, uh, whereas that is just not the case anymore. So let me ask you this, and maybe we can broaden this out 
Uh, and I don't know whether you can answer this question directly because it might be part of your top secret plans. I don't know. What happens when Specsavers says we should do something like this? What, what, what? Not necessarily maybe give away your gems because somebody from Specsavers might be watching this. Who knows? But a lot of businesses will face scenarios like that where they're either they face like COVID. Or they face a point where what they've had is, or the competition decides to up their game. Uh, what do you think? Tips, advice, what's on your horizon about that kind of stuff? So we um, we came into this field and it was already very well established. Um, you know, there's some big competitors out there. And our USP was that we'd have five pound as our entry price point for prescription glasses. And a couple of the competitors have tried to match it but then they don't have what I would call clarity of purchase because they might have the headline of 699 glasses, but actually they do everything in their power to make you have to spend 25 pounds. Whereas we have loads of customers that actually choose a five pound frame and they, you know, and their basket is a five pound frame. Um, and they're very happy with that. And, and I think that's one of our big things. And actually, um, you know, what you're saying, Dean is spot on. Specsavers have come into this market but um, one of our advantages is that we do not have any bricks and mortar. So mm. um, we can actually, um, we can stay at the five pound price point. Um, it's not, you know, as you would imagine, there isn't copious amounts of margin if you're sending out high quality products, but actually um, Specsavers will never put their frames down to five pounds because they've got rents, and staffing costs and professional fees that we, we don't have any of that. So let me ask you this, post you're working through what this looks like the other side yeah two quick questions what do you think the recovery is going to look like and what do you think how what's your plan how are you making sure you make the most of the recovery i know the changes that we've introduced here um, where um, our entire manufacturing facility is um, set up now so that there's actually physical social distancing um, everybody's wearing masks, everybody's wearing gloves, we've got disinfectant at every single um, ledge on the business, um, and that's quickly become a new norm. We separated the office staff to the manufacturing, so there's no cross-contamination. Um, all mail and all parcels are disinfected before they come in. Um, I think that's probably going to be um, the new norm for the foreseeable mm -hmm. future. I can't see it. And, and that was a challenge in itself, because people were like, I can't wear a mask all day. I was like, you have to wear a mask all day because it's not only protecting yourself, but it's protecting um, all your colleagues and who knows whose family have got um, medical issues. How are we um, going to recover the lost ground? Um, I think we're just going to keep doing what we're doing, to be honest with you, and just making sure that um, we never compromise on quality and that actually, um, you know, we're, we're actually one of the areas which was a, which has been a challenge is um, is around our customer services team. And so one of the uh, things I've done to, to help us recover a bit of lost ground is actually I've recruited a head of customer services. Um, but it's been really difficult to get good quality staff because many, many uh, employees in the customer services space have been furloughed. And funnily enough, when the weather is as beautiful as it has been, they're not looking to change the <laughs> You know, it's uh, so that, that's been a challenge. But um, I don't know. I think just going to recover. We're just going to continue to do what we're doing, and we're constantly looking at improving the site. And you know, and I, I think particularly in e-commerce, every day is a new day. E-commerce is a bit like stock trading, I think, because you know you're constantly having to adjust your strategy, or maybe not your strategy, but your daily tactics to make sure it performs it's by the minute, you know, or it's, it's so intense. You know, you're sitting at nine o'clock at night on your couch, but you're actually not watching what's on TV. You're watching, oh, how busy is the site? Is it working? You know, what's the conversion looking like? What's the bounce rate looking like? Um, has the average order value gone up or down? Why might that be? Oh, there's a fault on the site. We need to fix it. You know, it's, it's quite, it, it's exciting. It's very exciting, actually. There is this perception that people who sell online have it easy. I can remember running some ads for a client. This is well oh, four or five years ago. And if you run ads, you know, you, you build up so many different ads and you're just sat there watching which one 
which one works, which one doesn't, which one performs at the money you can you can stand and and sustain, and which ones don't. And sometimes it's the most stupid things that work, or the things that you just think, why is this working? Particularly on social ads, it should be this one. And uh, it's it's a tough old job. I mean, I don't know whether you can speak to that. Just in case there's some kind of e-commerce businesses out there, what are some of the things that you've learned from? kind of doing kind of online business in this way? Unlike traditional retail, I would say that we have found it very, very hard to say with any certainty that next Monday will be a great day or next Tuesday or Friday nights are great nights. You've got, um, you know, when we launched this, the weekends were terrible for us. And I couldn't understand that because um, in traditional retail and opticians, Saturday was always your best day of the week. But all of a sudden online, I could work out why on earth our sales were <laughs> on a Saturday, but on the Friday night they're fantastic. So I'd say that that's probably, it's, it, it's taken a lot longer. And I would still say actually that um, there's sometimes can be no rhyme or reason why something's worked brilliantly and why something else has not worked um, at all. And there's, there's a lot of trial and error. And I, I think my philosophy is always, I'm not for giving everything a shot. Um, but you know, be reactive. You know what? You know if it's a flop, and I've done quite a few. Um, I did quite a lot of advertising in, in the newspapers at the beginning, and they and and I watched them spike. I was front page of um, the Metro quite a few times, and that was quite an expensive spend. Um, I had full pages in the Sun, and sometimes you think, well, yeah, that's working brilliantly, and then all of a sudden it just seems to to nosedive, and it's. You, you, we, you know, myself and my team, we, there's a lot of synopsis going on. <laughs> so I don't think anybody would put their house on it that that's the reason because there's a lot of unknown going on. And you have to live with that unknown if you yeah. want to be successful on e-commerce. Yeah, with that, uh, you've got to be quite nervy and, um, you know, actually be willing to commit and trying lots of different things um, because I don't, I, you know, it, there's not one magic trick in this game. And depending on which marketing expert you talk to, they'll always tell you that their one works better than the others. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> uh, that would be probably my biggest tip is, um, is structure your um, your retainers with these people always based on success fee. Mm-hmm. Um, and make it a stretch because um, what I'd have, what my experience in the past was that first couple of months with an SEO agency or a PR company were fantastic. You got the full team, the senior team, they come around and they schmooze you. And then actually after month three, you start to get more junior and the work was rubbish. <laughs> and you know, it was and then by month six, you then realize you had a three month uh, notice period that you had to give them and it was you know, so it was that slippery slope where whereas now I've actually got teams that um, they're winning as we're winning. Your experience there with the whole marketing piece is, is not unusual. Um, in that you have to keep your marketing team team motivated. Yeah, it was interesting what you said there about month six, because there's a stat going round about retained clients, and the average retainer lasts less than three months. And and to defend marketer marketeers a little bit, it takes longer than three months to see if something fully works for the business. Yeah. But by six months, you should have a trajectory and you should know that this is a worthwhile relationship. And I think sometimes businesses are guilty of being too short with things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've seen, for example, somebody say, well, give me proof of concept with 500 quid on an ad campaign. It's very difficult to do that. That's ridiculous. Uh, And then you've got the opposite where you have companies who stick to something and never budge. Yeah. And uh, you probably found this, that sometimes you'll you'll do things and it'll work. And then you start to see the law of diminishing returns kick in. Uh, and actually, you just need to come back and go, you know, keep constantly a bit like you said, you know, once you get to midnight, it's a new day. You have to start again. Sometimes you have to go. Does this now work? Yeah. And I, I just to me, communication and honesty and it's it's more of a partnership, you know. It's like I, I would much rather someone says to me that didn't work. We're not going to do that again. Let's try this instead. Um, and, I, and that's what I'm looking for in the agency is someone to come and say to me, 
well, I've done this with another client and it worked brilliantly. I think we should try this. I will never say no to a recommendation like that because um, if you don't try it, you don't know. I'm, I'm going to give you your, you know, we've talked a little bit about business, talked a bit about COVID. You're on LinkedIn. Yeah, you're, it's not the place that you'd think of. Why, why are you on LinkedIn? What, did, what made you go to LinkedIn? It's a great forum for business. Um, it's a great forum. I learn a lot on LinkedIn, actually. Um, I follow quite a lot of influential people. Um, you, you can see what, not necessarily in my industry, but in other industries, what they're doing. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, back in my, in, in my early, early career, when I was, um, you know, in optics, I was, you know, and I was reaching out to other um, companies. It's a recognized way of cold calling somebody um, and having, as long as you've got something of interest, and not in a salesy pitch, but like, you know, I was speaking to a big um, German supermarket about putting opticians into them, and, and it was a good way to contact them. So I think like LinkedIn is um, it's a professional forum. That it's not salesy. Um, it's not. Um, this is what I did at the weekend, or here's a cute picture of my dog. It's um, it, it's business focused, and I, I like. I actually quite like it. Um, mm. I think it's a it's a it's becoming a good recruitment tool, actually, you know, to get really good people. Do you have a ridiculously audacious goal you want to achieve with the business, with low-cost glasses? What's, do you have a ridiculous goal that you kind of talk to yourself about that you'd be brave enough to share? I want to be number one in the marketplace, and I'll do what it takes to get there. And that is a ridiculous goal when you think about who owns the number one player at the moment and yep. how deep their pockets are. And I remember... We used to supply them actually with their best-selling men's brand because we have a few licensed brands. And then, and I remember this like yesterday, them saying to me, "We have so much money that we don't know how to spend it." And I thought, "Okay," and I don't have that much money, but <laughs> believe me, we're we are we're ambitious. I'd like to be. Um, I I would like no uh, low-cost glasses to be the number one in Europe. Um, that's my ridiculous ambition. But I think you've got to. You got to see it to believe it to make it happen, and you know if it's just hard, if it's hard work and patience. Well, I've got abundance hard work in me. Patience less so, but we, we're 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 disrupting the market, Dean. Every day, you know, we're, we brought out a next day glasses service. No one else can can touch that. Order your glasses by one o'clock. Get your glasses by one o'clock the next day. That's serious. We're being aggressive, um, and uh, yeah, that's my that's my goal. And when when agencies say to me, "Oh, you're doing quite well on your ranking." Whatever they say, you're right. Let's say for arguments, you're ranking 15th. I'm like, well, that's not where I want to be. I want to be top three and I want to be number one. And that's incredible, really, given where you've come just in this conversation, where you've come to going, actually, we're pecking at, you know, making serious dents into these um, these big guys here. Um, scary, must be scary. Yeah, but it's a great reason to jump out of bed um, and, and think, or I've got another day, you know, of doing this. And I've got the most, I've, I've really got a brilliant team. They're a small team, but they're really um, highly capable individuals and they're quite passionate about it. And, you know, in the early days when we first launched, um, you know, everybody was enjoying the success. Uh, and, and when I say success, I mean like small success. Um, and we were drinking champagne, you know, and it was becoming a bit of a joke that every Friday I was having to go to the local ASDA and buy five <laughs> bottles of champagne because we were smashing the targets. But actually, that we've continued on that trajectory, and I, I can't see any reason why we shouldn't continue doing what we're doing. And I think I think that's something we have. I can't say the name of it, but we have when we hit our targets in the business, we have uh, Friday kind of celebrations as a team. So everybody. And I think that's, it's not necessarily about the money. It's about seeing that their contribution makes a difference. Yeah, and absolutely. The things that I'm enjoying about having a much more smaller intimate team is that actually people they're listened to and they are actually contributing to the success. And um, yeah, it makes it it's harder though. But don't you find it a bit harder though, Dean, now that there's, everyone's working from home? What I found hard because... The nature of my business is there's a bit like yours. There's lots of moving parts and lots of people doing different things. We've come back to the office, but it's only kind of a fraction of the team are in the office. Some are working remote. Some are still furloughed. The hard bit is what used to be very simple, quick things. You now have to reach somebody on Zoom or something, find a time to talk to them, 
relay the information. You can't really rely on email with some of this stuff because you just need to be sure that everybody's on the same page. That stuff has been quite tricky. Just things like proofreading and typos and spell checks and stuff and getting information back and forth has just been little tiny things, but they create lots of delays in the process. That's been hard. Yeah, there's been a lot of articles about the, the, the challenge this will cause to creativity because when, when you have a group of people in a room, creativity um, is generated, whereas actually if everyone's working remotely, it's hard to generate that. The, co- the, the sparking off each other's ideas is, is, yeah. is very difficult too, yeah. Well, this has been a really, I was going to say, eye-opening, but I've tried to avoid all of the puns to do with vision and eyes and glasses, but it has been that, you know, somebody's taking on what seem to be it looks like to the the people outside your world as a as like it's like trying to take on tesco yeah Yeah? but you seem to be having a good go you seem to be having a good go and um it's really fascinating because when i read what you were saying in you know corporate law and everything i had a completely different perspective of you right and was expecting you know I don't know why, but I was expecting somebody a little bit more rigid. <laughs> I think I've just insulted a load of lawyers, by the way. Sergio, this has been fantastic. I'm sure people can can see how you're doing stuff. They can learn from particularly the things that you're trying new ideas and you're having a go. And they'll also be impressed that you do glasses for five pounds because I've been to the other places and come back penniless. <laughs> Guys, thanks for watching. Uh, Please do check out Sergio's website, lowcostglasses.co.uk. His details will be here. Find him on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm sure he'll be happy to connect with people on LinkedIn, right? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thanks for watching, everybody.